tonight is the law. We are told in the book of Acts that God is not power from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. I would like to change that a little and say to you that God is never so far off as even to be near. For nearness implies separation. And God and man are one. Man is all imagination. And God is man. And exists in us and within him. The eternal body of man is the imagination. And God is God himself. We cannot even be there. For nearness implies separation. On this weather, you and I can go a month. Go the first, exercising the same power that created the universe and sustained it. The only wonderful human imagination is God, that's God. By him all things were made, and the writing was not only thing made, but was made. Good, bad, or in this. Now tonight, let us share with you a story to show you that it's all your own wonderful human imagination. You might have read last Saturday, Los Angeles Times, on the front page in very, very tight, the story of a train. A story was shown and shown on TV and very, very popular by Rod Kelly. And here, a man who sees women to take that story and put it to his own personal gain. And so he threatened Thompson, the Australian airline, at 107 passengers aboard that he would blow the plane up at a certain altitude, but he did not pay $560,000, which they did. So paying is a cost $560,000. Based upon a so-called imaginary plot by Watson, when he realized what he had done, so he came in the story. He asked his producers to withdraw the film from TV and not show it anymore. They refused because of profit. It was written for profit, shown for profit, and they continued regardless of Congress or any other. If put or the unnumbered people that may suffer as a result of it. I did not see in his regret that he is going to give his income from his residuals to Pontus to repay the $560,000. No, he didn't say he was going to pay that that he would now make to the Australian Air Force. He's going to keep it and write another bunch of nonsense that he doesn't know what you know, that imagining creates reality. For God imagining creates, and God is man. So man imagining creates. There is no separation between God and man. We are one. God became as we are, that we may be as he is, allowing himself on this level to make all the mistakes in the world, and to go the search and to imagine any stupid thing in the world. Now, let me share with you a few stories. These stories by William Butler Gates. You can find them in his volume called Good and Evil. It first came out at the turn of the century. 
is part of his collective work. But the individual volume has been reprinted, I think, three or four times. And this is the chapter that he named Magic. He said, I was spending a vacation in Paris. And I got up early. I thought I would go out and get the morning paper before my host rose. And then I came through and I saw the little maid laying the table for breakfast. And I told myself one of those long stupid stories that one tells only to oneself. If something had happened which had not happened, I would have hurt my arm. And so I imagine myself with my arm in a sling. And as I pass by, I have so completely imagined myself with my arm in a sling that I cast my imaginal act upon that sensitive child, the little girl who is going to be preparing the breakfast table. And when I return with my paper, my host met me at the door and she was all in a dither inquiring about my arm for she said that the little girl the maid had told her that Mr. Yates came down with his arm in a sling then I remembered what I had done I simply imagined that had I done what I had not done I would have hurt my arm and my arm would now be in a sling so I cursed my imaginal act so intensely upon that maid she saw it as an act now he said just about the same time I thought intensely of a fellow student and a message I wanted to give him but I did not wish it committed to paper I wanted to tell it to him but he was not present two days later I got a letter from this fellow student who was several hundred miles away and just about the time that I had intensely thought of him and the message I appeared seemingly in bodily form as though in the flesh in a large hotel where he was amidst a large crowd of people and he told me that he would like me to return after the crowd was gone and then I vanished and returned that night at midnight and told him the message which he told me in his letter now he said I have no conscious knowledge of the projection I only know that I intensely thought of my fellow students and the message I wanted to convey and there I appeared in the midst of a huge crowd in a hotel several hundred miles away and he could tell me to return later after the crowd dispersed which I did at midnight and told him the message now he said I could tell you a number of stories of the power of imagination then he tells the one of Joseph Glanthorne which is a very popular story supposedly very very true well, this student at Oxford University, finding himself, well, without funds, could not continue his studies. And so, in the day that he left college, because he could not afford to continue, he found no job, and he joined himself to a bunch of gypsies, traveling gypsies. And one day, two students who knew him at college came upon him among the gypsies and he made a sign not to be identified and then came up afterwards and he told them I'll meet you in the inn and then I will explain to you why you find me among this crowd well they were curious so they went to the inn and when he came into the inn he told them they are not quite the vagabonds that people think that they are they have a secret that is not known at Oxford none of our professors know it I know I never heard about it said he so no one knows it 
but I'll tell you what they've taught me. And I have learned all that they've taught me so far, and I've improved the college. Now, to show you what I mean by it, I will leave you two fellows alone. And when I return, I will tell you what you have discussed in my absence. And so when he came back, he told them in detail what they had discussed, or everything they discussed. And they were curious, wondered why. He said, you had no choice in the matter. I determined what you would discuss. My imagination made yours. Their story is all about imagination. And they, by the complete control of their own imagination, influences your behavior. That's what I learned from them. But if God makes all things, well then God must be his human imagination. If a man could so control his own imagination that he influences your behavior and you think that you initiate what you do, then it was the man in control of his own imagination that did it. Then we understand what the poet said. All things by a law divine in one another's being mingle. I see you, you see me, for we not intermingle, I couldn't perceive you. If I couldn't penetrate your brain, and you couldn't penetrate mine, you couldn't perceive me. So all things by a law divine in one another's being mingled. The man who is in control of his own imagination, penetrating the whole vast world in which he is involved, could influence the world. So that is the secret that he tried to tell these two scholars who graduated from Oxford he could ill afford to continue his studies. So he quit because of the lack of funds. But he learned what no one at Oxford could teach him. The control of his own wonderful human imagination. For that is God. Imagination is that non-objective reality from which all objects pour forth just like sudden fancies. Everything in the world comes out of one's own wonderful human imagination. For that is God. And there is no other God. I know in my own case, sitting in New York City in my apartment, with an urge to comfort my sister 2,000 miles away across water, Simply stretched out of my bed, I left the living room, went to my room, closed the door and asked my wife not to disturb her. And in that interval I assumed I was in Barbados and on the bed where her son was dying of cancer. There was no hope of recovery. He was little at the age of 17 with cancer. And to comfort her I assumed I was her son, and actually felt myself to be there, and I imagined when I saw my sister Daphne come through the door, and look, and she saw her brother Neville, rather than her son, Bill, and she came over and she looked at me, I saw, and then I awoke back in New York City. Eight days later, this is before we had such a thing as airmail. It came by slow freight. And so eight days later, I got a letter from my sister Daphne. She said, Neville, I don't understand it. And she dated the letter. It was the day that I gave what I just told you. I said, I went to the room to see Billy. As I entered the room, it was you. I came over and I looked to what should be Billy. And I'm looking at you. I rubbed my eyes. I did everything to bring about the normal vision. And I couldn't see my son, Bill. I am only seeing my brother, Neville. And I couldn't understand it. Now, she began to feel, through the superstitions of the world, because Billy was dying of cancer, the next one to go would be her brother, Neville. That's how she interpreted it. She didn't know what I was doing in New York City. But what I did did not help. He died. 
he died of cancer. But I succeeded in projecting myself 2,000 miles away under the bed I knew so well. It was my father's room. It was my father and mother's bedroom. And there I knew that that's where Billy was sleeping. And I assumed I was on that bed and I was actually in the place of Billy. So when my sister saw me, she would be encouraged to have faith, to have hope. But she was so disturbed because no matter what she did, she rubbed her eyes, closed them, opened them, closed them, opened them, and she was still seeing Neville. And she can't see her son. Now when you hear these stories from those who are not lying to you, you may not understand it and reason will deny it. Well, if you have an experience. Even though reason denies it, you can't deny the experience. My sister cannot deny what she acts explains. And I could not deny what I did. Because when I came out that night, into the living room, a friend called at the cocktail hour, and she said, Never, you always seem so light and gay. And tonight you seem so heavy of spirit. I told her what I'd just done. Well, eight days later, when the letter came, I gave it to that same woman who was home again around the cocktail hour and showed her what my sister had written. So here my wife, and my friends were witnesses to what I told them eight days in advance I had done. Then came the letter from my sister asking for some explanation of it. So I tell you, I know from experience that imagining creates reality. On this level, we only learn, we're all students. We are simply in kindergarten, and we go the fifth as God served me. So he made a fortune writing this story. And it's still being shown all over on TV. And he will still get his residuals. And he'll take his residuals and pile it into some maybe IVM stuff or some other kind of stuff. He hasn't given it away. He'll write more nonsense. For it's all nonsense. But he doesn't realize what he's piling up for himself. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. As a man sows, so shall he be. You see yonder fields, the sesame was sesame, and the corn was corn. The silence and the darkness knew, and so is a man's fate born. So let no one think he's getting away with anything. So you misuse your talent, and you reap seeming rewards today in dollars and cents. Tomorrow you will reap it in another kind of payment. Another kind of payment tomorrow. And dollars and cents cannot buy it. Dollars and cents cannot free you from it either. You will go through the experience of having misused the talent that you receive. And the talent is the gift of God himself. God actually became man that man may become God. So this is the law by which we live. Learn to use your imagination lovingly on behalf of everyone in this world because you're going to reap the fruit of it. Whether you use it lovingly or unlovingly, you're going to reap the fruit of it. So I say to you tonight, God is not apart from man. He is never, not in eternity, so far off as even to be near because nearness implies separation. That statement from the 17th chapter of Acts would imply separation. He is not even separated. He can't even be near you because he is your own I. When you say I, that is God. When you say I am, that's God. His name forever and forever. And there is no other God. When you say thou, that's a false God. If you're dressing as you, that's a false God. The only God is I am. That is my name forever. And by this name I must be known throughout all generations. So do not misuse it. Now you can set yourself a goal. Any goal. And if you really know exactly what things would be like, if you have realized it, and then enter into that state 
And I tell you, it will become to you objective. At the moment it seems only a shadow. Just a shadow. Because you have not entered into the sketch. When you enter into the sketch, the sketch takes on a cubic reality and becomes objective to you. Not to another, but to you. Now leave it alone. In time, in its good time, it will flower and become what the world calls an objective reality. It was real the very moment you entered it, because you are the reality. All things exist in the human imagination, but all things, you name it, it exists in you. But it exists in you only as a shadow. It's shadowy. For if you enter into the so-called shadow and clothe yourself with it, it ceases to be a sketch and it becomes a cubic reality, just like with you. At this moment, your home you know so well is only a shadow. And this room, if you do not know very well, it seems so real because you are in it. Now, everything in this world, so-called natural effects, every natural effect has an imaginal cause and not a natural. A natural cause only seems it is a delusion of the fading memory. Our memory, yes, is good, it's adequate for sameness, but it's not perfect. I'll show you. When you go home tonight, take an ordinary note, a magazine, take the cover, a landscape, or a postcard, and look at it and know exactly what you're doing. You're looking at the postcard. Try to memorize it. Spend as much time as you want on it. Spend an hour if you want. Try to memorize that card. And you think you know it, all right, you know it. Now turn it over and try to reconstruct it from your memory of it. And be honest with yourself and see how far you are from what you were observing. Yet when you turn it over, your memory picture of it is good enough for saying it. You know it's the same card because it is good enough, but it's not good enough for the after picture. So our memory is all right. It's good enough for the call to say it. And so that's why man does not remember what he has imagined. He forgets what he's imagined, he sets it in motion. And when it confronts him as his harvest, he denies he had anything to do with it. He can't remember what he did. Now, every imaginative man in this world is forever casting, I would say, glamour and influencing the entire world of the passive unimaginative. They're forever falling under the influence of those who are vivid in their imagination. They are reaping it, and you'll understand the cry on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. For some vivid imagination has compelled them to act as they act. So forgive them, the actors. Any condemnation goes to the author, not the actor. Man condemns the actor in the drama. When really, if there's any condemnation, it is really the author, not the actor. And the author of the play is God, for God is your own wonderful human imagination. This one that extorted $560,000 from Qantas, he didn't conceive it, he saw it on TV. And it gave him an idea. And he thought, maybe I can get away with it. Well, who is the author of it? Rod Sterling. Very Sterling, he was the one who conceived it. And here was an actor who thought, here's an idea to get a half million dollars. And he got it. Because there were 107 souls aboard that plane. And they couldn't run the risk that it may not be true. 
And if at a certain altitude it would go off, then they had to pay that extortionist the $560,000 and save the lives of the 107 souls aboard that plane. So he got the money and he was the actor. If you catch him, undoubtedly they'll send him up for life. But who is the actual culprit? So he wrote it. And so he's making all kinds of money out of that that he wrote. And he continues to make it. He wrote a series that came, well, it went for two or three years at prime time. It's now still selling at other times called Twilight Zone. All of his marvelous imagination. It doesn't hurt anyone what he did in that one. But he has made a fortune using the talent. But in this he misused his talent. And his regret does not alter the fact. But in the end, no one gets away with any misuse of his talent. He pays it in a way that money will never be able to compensate. That's the story. So your own wonderful human imagination is God. And that God is creating all the phenomena of the world. As this really said, man is not the creature of circumstances. Circumstances are the creatures of men. We are creating them. We are not the victims of circumstances. We are creating circumstances. Man is not the creature of circumstances. Circumstances are the creatures of men. Benjamin Disraeli. Don't do something. There was a man, an able, able man, who said Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. Never deny that he was a Jew. His very name tells you who he is. Benjamin Disraeli. Just is out. Israel, Benjamin of Israel, that's what his legal name is. He never denied he was an Israelite. But he knew that the Christian faith, if properly understood, was but the flower, the fruit on the tree of Israel, the fulfillment of it. When God actually became man and flowered in man, and the whole vast wonderful imagination that is God awakened in a man. And he knew that he was God. And he tried to tell his word. And they denied it. That was not what they were looking for. And buried in every man is God. And in each man he has to awaken. And when he awakens, he is God. But before he awakens, oh, does he go amok. Does he make mistakes, these horrible mistakes of the world. But the day will come, he will completely awaken within man. And when he does, he will be governed by love. And nothing but love. Until he's completely governed by love, what horrors we create in this world. So the whole vast objective world is created by the imaginal act of men. Everything now proven in the world was once only imagined. I don't care what it is. The simplest of the thing, the chair, the dress you wear, the hat, the house, everything was only imagined and then executed. It began all in the imagination of man. Everything is in this world is nothing more than the imaginal act of men who start. Good, bad, or indifferent. So tonight, you take me seriously. I know that you and you alone are responsible for the phenomena 
in your world. If you are passive and not alert, you can be influenced because all things by a law divine in one another being given. But it's still the one being. And so you can be influenced. You and I, I trust that you could not be influenced to take a picture shown on TV and extort a half million dollars. I trust your ethical code is beyond that. But not everyone is beyond it. You and I, I hope, are beyond such things. But there are a number of people who are not, and they will simply be influenced by the powerful imagination of a writer, a very successful writer. Who is it tonight? He was invited by some university to speak on the art of writing, could demand maybe two thousand, three thousand dollars for his appearance. And he knows nothing concerning the story of the Bible, but nothing. Had he known it, he, not, he would not have done it. So you know it, and he doesn't. If he makes his three thousand, if he wants to take it, he doesn't have to take it, he has so much money, he doesn't need it. But you have what he doesn't have. You have awakened to the point of knowing how to use your imagination lovingly on behalf of others. For this is the law of Scripture. When we speak of the law and the promise, this is the law. That your imaginal acts are creating facts in this world. Imagining creates reality. So watch carefully what you are imagining and you return tonight. And you are about to go to sleep. See that your mind is filled with lovely things, imaginal things, and drop off into that state. Do not let the sun go down upon your anger. Actually resolve it within yourself and speak as though things were as you would like them to be and make them lovely, make them altogether marvelous in your world. I tell it for your own good because in the not distant future, not only the little crowd here, but the whole vast world will have departed. Those who are now claiming themselves to be another generation and demanding precious service, they will in the not distant future be old people who will vanish from this world. It's time that we all woke up and catch on to what really is causing the phenomenon of the world. And the phenomenon of the world is caused by the imaginal acts of men. So you take it seriously and do not let one day come to its end without revising and changing the imaginal acts of the day and make it conform to your dream, to your ideal and live in it just as though it were true. For I am telling you from my own experience the day will come you will sit and you will think of something that isn't present. The world calls that imagination. If you see something that is present, they call that thinks proceed. That's weak. You think of something that is not present, they call that imagination. But you will know how to enter that which is not present to your senses. And your entrance into it will give it to it reality. And it will be just as real as the room in which you are seated. It will become objective to you, the whole vast world is just like that. But that will be transcended by the being that is going to be awakened within you. For that being who awakes the evil is God himself. This is God's key glow to the human mind. And when he awakes, it is God at intensity. And there is nothing that is absent, for he is omnipresent. So he views everything from where he is. He doesn't think of because he's omnipresent. And being omnipresent, he sees every being as they are. And they are not what they appear to be outwardly to the world of things. They are what they are in heart. He sees exactly what they are thinking, what they are feeling, what they are plotting what they are planning. He sees all the intentions of the heart. 
But when someone tells you, well, why did it happen to him and not to that one? When he is so prominent in the world. Look what he did. He built a hospital. He endowed it. He gave a fortune. God sees the heart. He doesn't see the fortune he gave to build the hospital and even to endow it. He sees what no one on the surface sees. He sees the motive behind the gift. He sees everything behind it all. Because he sees everything, because being omnipresent, he sees everything as it is. Now, but when you are told, he called all before him and said, no, I reject him. This is to pick out the one called David. He rejected his brother, but he said, man judges after the appearance, and God sees only the heart. So I reject him, I reject him, I reject him. Called the other one, and then came David. And there is a man after my own heart who will do all my will. And so, now you'll realize, if you take it seriously, what is in store for all of us. The end is God. The origin of all was God. In the interval, we go berserk. We run them up. But if you know what you could do, start doing it. Don't wait. You can be the man you can be the woman that you would like to be. That is, wanting it is not going to do it. You must be it. You can't just say, I would like to be it. You must assume that you are it. And keep in the assumption that you are it. For the assumption, though at the moment denied by your senses, denied by everything around about you, is persisted in will harden into fact. So you dare to assume that you are the man, the woman that you want to be. And day after day, live in that assumption as though it were true. And that assumption will become a reality in your world. Even if you go hungry, doesn't matter. No matter what happens, go hungry. But persist in the assumption. And that assumption will objectify itself and become a reality in your world. Do not fall by the wayside for any little thing on the side. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am when I get your letters. For in your dream, you are teaching the law of imagination. When someone raises your race, will in a dream have an argument, say, with a priest or a rabbi or a minister. And you are instructing them and telling them, now a dream you know is egocentric, it's your selfish self. But yet here you are, you're actually taking the symbols of authority and simply bringing them down to a certain level. They're no longer your authority. You are instructing now and telling them, which is yourself, no visible, what you have discovered concerning the cause of the phenomena of life. And when you have these dreams and you share them with me, you tell them, as you do, I can tell you my fear. Everyone will one day awaken. And when he awakens, he awakens in the only place where God ever awakens. He awakens in this skull of man, in Golgotha, the human skull. And when he awakens, he comes out of that skull, and it is God that is born, born from above. And then he goes through the normal series of time and he arrives at that point where he becomes, well, of age. He reaches the age of spiritual puberty. And then the father, the earthly father, disappears. For when he reaches the age of twelve, Joseph disappears from the scene. And now he is now a creator. He can actually create his own image. He creates because he has reached the age of spiritual beauty. And so the earthly father ceases to be a part of the play. 
when the lad in the temple which is the age of God. But he has foreshadowing of it before and after. It's a proxy tale. It didn't say twelve. When he was about twelve years of age, they sought him and they wondered, why did you do this to us? And he said, did you not know I should be about my father's business? And he was talking to his father and his mother. And they did not understand him. And then Joseph disappears from the play. He is no longer brought back into the play. For he has become the father. And so the son becomes the father. He now creates as God the father. But tonight, I want it to be only on this level. The level of well, the law. For a man, if he is in control of his own imagination, he is in control of the phenomena of his life. He is not a victim of circumstances. Circumstances are the creatures of himself. He creates them if he knows what he is doing. If he doesn't know what he is doing, and he is passive in this world, he can be influenced by the imagination of one who is in control of his imagination, though he doesn't know what he's doing, like stirring this involved. Had he known, he wouldn't have done it. And to this day, he doesn't know. He only regrets what he did. But he doesn't know that his imagining is creating reality. He sees the evidence before him and still doesn't know it. I tell you, imagination creates reality. So be careful what you imagine, because you are setting in motion. And because all things, by a law divine, in one another's being mingled, you are influencing everyone, even though they do not see your picture or read your book. As Yates again said, having seen the operation of this law, we should never be certain it was not some woman treading in the wine press who started that subtle change in men's minds. Or that the passion, because of which so many countries were given to the sword, did not begin in the mind of some shepherd boy, lighting up his eyes for a moment before it ran upon its way. Who knows who this night feels neglected? feels hurt, feels wrongfully accused, and who is sitting alone and treading in the wine cup, who tomorrow will influence some catastrophe. Some shepherd boy dreaming of some heroic future, and thinking only in terms of war that could bring him the crown of a hero, and he, while tending his sheep, he is simply dreaming of being a hero and using his talent, which is God, using his imagination, in some destructive manner, even though he tends to seek. <laughs> I say to everyone, know what you are doing every moment of time, because your imagination is creating reality. Now let us go into the silence.